Tremendous. Terrific. Good. We want to thank Jake and his team for leading out in the singing. It's wonderful. Where's our chocolate bars? <laughs> hey? Oh, okay. Alrighty. Good morning, Stu. How are you? I'm fine, Matt. Grab a, a microphone over there because I'm taking over. <laughs> Matt, I have uh, three questions for you today. Okay. I hope you're ready for this. Just, Always uh, ready. Just go ahead. Oh, oh, that's a good idea. Oh, what? Go ahead. What is that? A chocolate fish? A good give, old fashioned banana I'll flavored marshmallow chocolate fish. I'll give you mine because I'm a vegetarian. Oh no, it, maybe it's all right now. <laughs> so Matt, I have a couple yep. questions for you, you don't okay. mind? No, no, I've that's been, fine. I've been waiting for this all week. Okay, um, all right. Uh, Matt, do you know what the game of cricket is all about? <laughs> <laughs> I just uh, Travis, if you were a mate, you'd come and stand by me. <laughs> no, I uh, just wanted to tell you, I'm not going to ask you any questions New about Zealand cricket. New Zealand played very well. Yeah, is that right? Ouch. Oh, my. <laughs> we played terrible. Yeah. Mm. I'm so glad that I'm here in New Zealand when something like this happened. Matt, first question, mm -hmm. if there, um, tell us about a place in the world that you have not yet visited, but that you'd like to visit. Ireland. Ireland? Yeah. Tell us why you'd like that. I think it's, uh, well, for first, first thing, it's, an, uh, it's a country where there's just so much uh, controversy, so much mm. upheaval, and yet there is such a rich history of Ireland as yeah. well. Yeah. And I'd like to go on and just see for myself. Um, yeah, I just love the Irish culture. Yeah. I love Celtic music. Um, and it, some of my ancestors f were from Ireland. Uh, you do well so that explains a lot. You do well kissing the Blarney Stone, too. I can just yeah. see you doing that. That'd be great. <laughs> What's that? Matt, you have, uh, you have two <laughs> children. It's a, it's a cricket term. You wouldn't know oh, about yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Matt, you have two children. Yep. Tell us about them, and then um, tell us about the birth of um, of your son. He's the oldest, right? Yeah. Tell us what that day was like for you. Oh wow, that that, that was a fantastic day actually for two reasons. Uh, my wife went into labour around about midnight on the night that Australia beat South Africa in the cricket. <laughs> uh, so um, Deb kept saying to me, "Look." you need to get some sleep because you need to rub my back continuously all day. Uh, but I said, no, the cricket's on, so I I'm watching the cricket. Um, but I was just astonished. You know, I was a registered nurse before I became a minister. I knew all the theory about you ladies giving birth and all that. But, um, man, I tell you, they're phenomenal, aren't they, ladies? They really are. Um, what I saw my wife go through <laughs> was just unbelievable. Um, and, it pro and it was a good birth. But um, I remember when Ryan came out. Um, remember how I asked you a question on Monday, I think? When was the time you felt closest to God? That, that was when I felt closest to God, when my children were born. Uh, to see Ryan, you know, this thing that's been kicking you in the back for months where it's it's just uh, your wife's belly is you know out here and to all of a sudden see him and to hold him and uh, to say hey this is something that god has given us was just a wonderful experience and the same thing with rachel um it just it was a little bit more um not touch and go but it was a little more difficult for debbie when she had rachel so we were very concerned but um yes i have two wonderful children i talked to them on the phone last night and um, Rachel told me she went wimming. Wimming? Wimming with oaties. Okay. Swimming with floaties. With floaties, she, oh, that's right. And, um, you know, to hear your little girl say, bye bye, daddy, love you. Oh, my. You know, oh, you know, really. It's about as, for their about wonderful as good children. As it gets. We're yeah. very blessed. That's wonderful. Mm. Nothing quite as uh, spectacular of a miracle. No. That's birth, is it? No. And, and just to, to see this little person. Yeah. And to say to yourself, this is a person that Jesus died for. Yeah. Before they were even a, even a twinkle in our eye. Yeah. And that this person has the capacity to live forever. Mm -hmm. It was just a phenomenal, yeah. a phenomenal special, thing. It? 
Mm. And you've all felt that too, haven't you, with the birth of your children. It's just spectacular. Mm. Matt, you're, uh, you're just coming to a new assignment. Mm -hmm. You're uh, one of the pastors now at Papatoy mm -hmm. Church. Mm -hmm. I was thinking of um, what would happen if you had the opportunity to preach just one time at Papatoy, just one sermon, what would the subject of that sermon be? I was fair with you this week. I gave you the questions before. <laughs> um, Peter Reeds. <laughs> no, no. Um, well, obviously it would... Obviously, it would be about Jesus, but I would probably, my, the text I would take would be the parable of the great wedding banquet. Um, I think that um, in Matthew 22, I think there is more truth per square inch there than um, just about anywhere else, and that will actually more than likely be my first sermon at Papatoe. So, for wish all I you members. Wish I could be here to, uh, to hear about it. Well, I, I've enjoyed this role reversal uh, today. I've enjoyed it very much, and I'm going to have prayer now, and Matt's going to preach this morning. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Matt, lead us in prayer, okay? Okay, all right. Let's have a prayer together. Lord, we thank you that we are part of your family. We thank you that you are the common denominator with each one of us. Lord, we thank you that you created us all as individuals and we thank you that you love us as individuals too we thank you that you died for us and we thank you that you're coming again but we also thank you lord for what you want to do in our lives and lord by your grace we ask that you'll help us to never cease to be amazed by your love your mercy and your grace towards us this morning as we study your word with pastor Stu tyner lord we ask that you will bless this occasion that you will keep us mindful of your presence with us and that you will bless um, Stu as he, as he leads our study. In Jesus' name, amen. I won't eat my fish during your presentation. You, okay. you, you take mine down there and I'll come and see you right afterwards. Are you sure? I can okay. trust you. Thank you, Matt. It's been good getting acquainted with you and with all of you this week. Thank you for being so faithful in your attendance. Uh, Sitting through the, the uh, airplanes flying over and the uh, kindy tent singing with us and uh, the buses off to the zoo and all the other things that we've had. Thank you for your questions and your comments afterwards. It's been lovely getting better acquainted with you and talking to you about uh, what's on your heart, your reaction to some of the things that I've said. Thank you for that. Uh, I wanted to thank... Um, all the people that have uh, made this uh, so easy to do, Matt and uh, Travis, thanks for all the work that you've done. Jake and your team and uh, John before leading out in the music. And um, uh, Paul, thanks for playing and being here, your first camp meeting. It's just been great to have you here. I hope that you've enjoyed these studies. Um, I keep finding out that there is more in the Bible than we can find, ever get to. This week, studying for these messages, which I have preached about before, I found new things that I didn't know were there before. Studying in the, for the evening meetings in the youth tent uh, on subjects that are familiar to me, but I always love to try to put away old sermons and, and uh, dig down again and preach new ones every time on the subjects, I found things I hadn't seen before. And I, I don't know how long that can keep up, but every time I study a Bible passage that I've read before and before and before, I find something new there. Our children love to study the Bible, but I don't think we ever exhaust the wonderful truths that God has for us in the Bible. So I hope that part of what's happened this week is that you've been encouraged to open the Bible to passages that perhaps are a little bit new to you. I think the story that we will look at today is one that very few of you will know really well. It's one that we just generally pass right over. I think I discovered it for the first time within the last six months. We were doing a sermon series in our church from the life of David. 
I got one of the assignments and it was kind of halfway through the series and so I began to look halfway through David's life and I found this story and I just don't remember ever studying it before, maybe passing by it, but I hope that you'll continue to look at the Bible's new stories and the old ones you know so well and let God speak to you. Remember, that's the point of Bible study. Let God speak to us today. Um, we're trying to find what the face of God really looks like we know that God is the hero of all of the stories in the Bible, and we know that the Bible tells us something about salvation. So keeping that in mind, if you'd like to open your Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 14. 2 Samuel 14, and while you're on your way, let me set the story up for you. I want to tell you about the three main characters. There are several other characters in the background to this story. But the three main characters to 2 Samuel chapter 14. The first primary character in this story is Joab. You remember Joab as the uh, captain of the army for David almost all of his life. But Joab has known David since they were little boys. Joab is David's nephew. He's the son of David's sister Zeruiah. Do you remember we got acquainted with her yesterday morning, sitting around having family worship in front of the tent in Bethlehem, in front of the great uh, fire pit there in the evening and the beautiful uh, dark skies with all of the stars over Bethlehem. Zeruiah, one of David's two sisters that we know their names, and she grew up and in those days you didn't go very far away from home. She grew up there in Bethlehem, married a uh, Young Bethlehem man, they begin to have children. One of her children's name is Joab. And so Joab is David's nephew. They grew up together. When David came in from the fields one evening and he said that he had been attacked by a lion and that God had given the lion into his, uh, into his strength, he had delivered David from the lion's paw, no doubt Joab was sitting around the circle listening or at least within the next couple of hours, heard the story. When David came in and said the same thing about God delivering him from the paw of the bear, Joab was there. Joab grew up with David. They were close to each other in age and um, stayed together almost all their lives. Early on, while David was uh, battling Saul's army, Joab and his two brothers began to pursue Saul's army back to their headquarters. And they were especially close to Abner's chariot. Abner, remember, was the captain of the army for Saul. For, um, Saul. And one of Joab's brothers was particularly swift runner. And he kept up with Abner's chariot. And it made Abner mad. And Abner stopped his chariot, and he got out, and he said to Joab's brother, Quit running after me. I'm, I'm bothered by what you're doing. And uh, he got back up in the chariot and started off again, and the little brother ran off again. He kept up with the chariot. And finally, Abner stopped the chariot, got out, and killed Joab's brother. And it was one of those turning points in Joab's life that we all have some time. We can look at those places in our lives where things changed, and this was the place where Joab's life changed. He decided to devote himself to becoming a brilliant military strategist. And he rose in the ranks of the army, became the captain of David's army. But along with uh, being brilliant, he became brutal. And while we know this man as capable, a capable soldier, we have to admit he's one of the most brutal people that we know about in the Bible. Uh, ultimately, it is Joab that finds Abner and kills him in revenge for the murder of his little brother. It is Joab who kills Uriah, Bathsheba's hu husband, uh, at least arranges for the, his death. And ultimately, it is Joab who finds Absalom hanging in the tree by his hair, and he goes and kills David's son Absalom. It's a brutal man. 
He is, uh, he is loyal to David almost all of David's life. When David is an old man and about to, to die, and you remember that David's uh, fourth son, Adonijah, decided that he wanted to be king, and he invited Joab to be his, Adonijah's, military commander, and, and, and uh, Joab left David's side and went over to the side of Adonijah. But you remember that David had promised that it would be Solomon that would follow him, not Adonijah. And when Solomon became king, he called Adonijah in, and he, um, he called Joab with him and ultimately executes Joab for leaving his father's side. Uh, fulfilling what Jesus would say later, the people that live by the sword die by the sword. Uh, at one point, as David is reflecting on some of the battles that he's been in with Joab, he writes a psalm about the experience. It's Psalm chapter 60, if you'd like to look at it. And in the introduction to the 60th psalm, you'll find Joab's name. It says... Um, that, this, that uh, when, when he was fighting, when David was fighting, and when Joab returned from a significant victory against the Edomites, David wrote this psalm, and notice what he says down at the very end of the 60th psalm. The help of man is worthless, but with God we will gain the victory. Same message that David needs to learn all of his life. Same message that all the Old Testament people seem to, to learn. And I have to wonder if David and his nephew Joab sat around after this particular victory. Joab telling David, his uncle, what, was, what had happened at the great battle that he had just fought. And David reflecting perhaps with Joab. You know, it's wonderful that we have these victories, but we couldn't do it without God. It's God that gives us the victory. And so he writes that, with God we will gain the victory. But this chapter in 2 Samuel 14 is one that is in between the military stories in Joab's life. It's a calm in the middle of, st of the storms. And in chapter 14, we see a totally different side of Joab than we see in all the rest of his story. Joab is one of the main characters in this story. The second main character in the story of uh, 2 Samuel 14 is a woman whose name we don't know, but she is called the wise woman of Tekoa. The wise woman of Tekoa. We don't even know too much about this little place where she lived. We do know from other passages in the Bible that there were a lot of shepherds on the hills of Tekoa. This is the town where Amos comes from later on in the Bible story. And in just a little bit as we open chapter 14, we'll read a, a lot more about this woman. She's one of the main characters. And then there is, of course, David in this chapter. David is now in the middle of his reign. He's in his 50s. He was 30 when he became king in Hebron. He was king until he was 70, and this is about halfway through. David, you remember, had lost the love of his youth, Michael, Saul's uh, daughter, who had been given to David as a wife, and then David was off at a battle, and Saul took her back and gave her to another man to marry, and it was a tragic heartbreak for uh, David. Later on, uh, in discussions with Abner, Saul's commander, David said, you could come over and join my side if you'll bring Michael with you. Uh, there's a sad little note in 2 Samuel chapter 6 that tells us that in, as opposed to all of the wives that David had, Michael went through all of her life without having any children. And David has lost this love, and he he goes to Hebron, he's, being, he's been made king there, he lives there for seven and a half years, and in that seven and a half years, David has six sons with six different wives. He was a busy man, David was. We don't know how many daughters he had in addition to the sons, but there was quite a group of children that followed David to Jerusalem at 37 years old when he moved to Jerusalem to become king of all of the nation of Israel. 
There he meets Bathsheba, and with Bathsheba he has four more sons, including Solomon. And then the Bible tells us that in his years in Jerusalem with his previous six wives, he had nine more sons plus daughters. There were at least 20 boys running around the palace. Uh, When you add up the ones born in Hebron, the ones born in Jerusalem, the ones to his six six wives, and then to Bathsheba, his seventh wife, plus children with his concubines, (laughs) plus all the daughters that we're not told of their names. It is an amazing group of children running around the palace. No wonder it took David a long time to build this big house for himself to live in. Just one bedroom for each of the children, and you can imagine how many bedrooms the place had to have. We know the name of one of the daughters that David had. She was born in in Hebron to the same woman that... Absalom was born to, and her name is Tamar. And we have to speak about Tamar and the background of the story before we get to 1 Samuel chapter 14. Do you remember in the palace in Jerusalem, David's oldest son, Amnon, was sick with love for his sister Tamar. It's a tragic story in the Bible. It's in the chapter just ahead of the one that we're going to look at today. And uh, Amnon has a friend, actually a cousin, that comes to him, Jonadab, who is the uh, son of one of David's brothers. And he comes to Amnon and says, you just look miserable, what's the matter? And Amnon says, I'm just really wanting my sister uh, Tamar, and I don't know what to do about it. And so this cousin suggests this plan that, that he pretend, Amnon, pretend to be sick. And David, amidst all of the other things that he has to do as king, and all the other things that he has to do as a father and a husband, visits his sick children when they're not feeling well. And Jonadab says to Amnon, if you will pretend to be sick, David will come to visit you and you can ask David if he wouldn't ask Tamar to make some food for you and bring it to you and that that'll make you feel better. By the way, this is the first time in 2 Samuel 13 verse 5 that the word pretending appears in the Bible. Not the last time, but the first time. And its first use in the Bible gives us the flavor that it is not a positive characteristic among God's people. In fact, throughout the Bible, there are things that are said about people who pretend to be one way when they're really another way. Uh, Jeremiah 5 says, Among my people are wicked ones who lie in wait like those who snare birds and set traps to catch others. Pretending to be one thing, they do another thing. And then this is the first time the Bible uses the word pretending, but interestingly, it comes up a couple of more times in this story. So the evil deed is done. We read about it there in chapter 13. It's a sad story. Do you remember that as soon as it's over, Amnon hates Tamar and sends her away in shame? When Tamar realizes what is about to happen, She pleads with her brother not to do this evil deed. And it's interesting that what she says, apparently it would not have been against the law for Amnon and Tamar to get married. And do you remember that Tamar says to to Amnon, David will, if, if you want to marry me, David will okay the marriage. It wouldn't have been against the law, and she thinks that she could have gotten David's approval or at least his sanction for the marriage. But what Tamar was objecting to was not the physical union with this man who was her half-brother, but the way it was done and the manner it was done. In fact, the Bible calls it a rape. One of the great things about the Bible's telling of this story, I believe, is that the guilt is laid squarely at the feet of Amnon. You know how many times something like this happens, and um, 
a defense attorney will try to say the woman enticed the man to do this. It's really the woman's fault. And in a patriarchal society like we have in the background of the Bible and in a story where we don't even know David's mother's name and we don't know the names of most of the daughters in the story, it would have been very uh, understandable if the Bible had said, well, Tamar enticed Amnon, but it's not what the Bible says. The guilt is laid squarely at Amnon's feet, and I think that's encouraging to see that. Tamar, however, objects, and she says something incredible, I believe, in chapter 13, verse 12, showing that she understands the high standards of God's people. She says to Amnon, such a thing should not be done in Israel. She doesn't say, well, everybody else is doing it. I guess it would be okay for us to do it too. Which is the excuse you hear for many sins that are committed by God's people today. Many of the things that we do, we just say, well, look, it's happening in the world all the time. What's, they, they're seeming to get along okay after they've done these things. We can do these things too. Tamar on the other hand, has a hugely high standard. And she holds it up as strongly as she can. Such a thing should not be done in Israel. She understands the high calling of being God's children. And just an aside here, if we really believe that what the Bible is saying is to teach you and me something, here is part of the story that teaches us that God's people have higher standards than the people around us. We can't do the same things that everybody else is doing because we are the children of the king, and that makes us different. And Tamar understands. The deed is done. Tamar uh, is sent back home in uh, dust and ashes and mourning. And the reactions to this deed are just incredible to read. Tamar becomes a desolate woman. She becomes disgraced, and she lives for the rest of her life in the house of Absalom, her brother. One of David's daughters, a princess in Israel. She never marries. She never lives in her own home. She lives for the rest of her life with her brother Absalom. David becomes furious at what happens. This is not just against the law in Israel. This is not just a blight against his kingship. But remember... This is David's firstborn son and his daughter. And you know what it feels like, many of you, when our children walk away from God and do things that they shouldn't. Here is how David feels, his firstborn son and his daughter. Absalom, Tamar's brother, full brother, begins to hate his older brother Amnon. And he plans revenge that ends up destroying much of the serenity of the household of David. We'll talk about that more in a minute. One lovely little picture about Absalom in the midst of a story that is largely negative. Absalom takes his sister Tamar into his home and keeps her there. And Absalom and his wife end up having four children, three sons and one daughter. And Absalom names his daughter... Tamar after his sister and the Bible says that little Tamar grew up to be a beautiful woman and so in Absalom's home the rest of his life is older Tamar a desolate woman and little Tamar a beautiful woman perhaps helping Absalom's sister to forget the disgrace and to put her life into the life of little Tamar Lovely thing about Absalom. I wish we could say more good things about him than we do. Two years pass. Absalom plans a banquet and invites all of David's sons to come to the banquet. He invites David as well. David refuses. I think probably Absalom knew that his father would refuse to come. David said, just take all the boys and have a good time. And so they put on a huge banquet but Absalom gets a few of his close followers and he said at a particular time in the banquet when Amnon has had a little too much to drink and he's rejoicing, I will give you the message and I want you to go to the place in the table where he's sitting and I want you to kill Amnon. And don't worry, I'm the prince, 
I'm the son of David. I'm telling you what to do. You do it. And it happens just exactly like that. Amnon is killed. All the other sons of David get up, run outside of the building, jump on their donkeys, and head back for Jerusalem. But one runner gets back to Jerusalem ahead of everybody else. Interestingly, it's Jonadab again, the, the nephew of David, the son of one of David's brothers. And he, has, uh, he gets back to find out that the message has already gotten to David that all of his sons have been killed by Absalom. Every one of the sons has been killed. And David jumps up, he tears his robes, he begins to mourn and wail, just as Jonadab comes in and said, no, 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 it's not all of your sons, it's just Amnon. Absalom has been planning this for a long time, and he's killed your son. It doesn't make David feel an awful lot better. David has been furious at Amnon, but it is his firstborn son, and none of us like to lose our children, no matter what the circumstances. And just as David is beginning to switch from all of his sons dying to just Amnon, he looks up and here come all the donkeys with all the other boys running back to dad saying this terrible thing that's happened. David mourns for his firstborn, but he also has to begin mourning for Absalom, who he banishes away from the capital city, and Absalom is banished for three years. And it is toward the end of this banishment of Absalom for Jerusalem from Jerusalem, from his father and all of the family, that we come to 2 Samuel chapter 14. Joab, who is in the daily presence of David, begins to realize that the reason that David is so downcast and discouraged all the time is that he misses Absalom. And so Joab begins to wonder if there was something that he could do some scheming that he could figure up that would get David and Absalom back together. And he decides on a plan that involves somebody else, and he goes to the little town of Tekoa to a woman who has a marvelous reputation of being a wise woman. The Bible doesn't tell us why she has this reputation, simply calls her the wise woman of Tekoa. And Joab meets with this wise woman, and here's the plan that they come up with. David asks the woman to go, I mean, Joab asks the woman to go to see David and to tell David that she is a widower who had two sons. And one day, one of the sons, uh, the, both of the sons were out in the field working, and they got into a fight, and the old one son knocked the other son down, and he fell down and hit his head in the rock and died. And he's standing over this brother that he's just killed, and he realized what's happened. He runs home to mom, and then all of the people in the clan find out what happens, and they demand, like the law required, that this boy's life be given because of what he's done. And the mother says to David, or she's going to say to David, if, if they take the life of my second son, then my husband's name cannot be passed on. It will be a tragedy. She says, the, the only burning coal I have left will be taken from me. And Joab believes that this woman pretends to be a widower with this one son that's, that's dead, that maybe David will catch the, the lesson of the story. And the woman agrees to do this. It's a familiar story. Do you know this story really well? Some of you don't know it. Good. Uh, it's just a fascinating story, isn't it? Um, the woman uh, goes into ki to King David, into the room where the king holds the audience, and she uh, raises her hand and said, I'd like to speak to you. This is the way that the Israelites approach their ruler all the time. It's not a strange thing. Clear back in the time of the judges, you remember how the people would come to meet Deborah under the palm tree? This is where it began. And, and later on in this, in this story, when Absalom wants to be king, do you remember he goes out to the city gates and he, he stops the people that want to come in and talk to David. And he said, why don't you just tell me your problems and I'll solve them for you. And a little bit later in Solomon's reign, early on, do you remember that the two women with the one baby come in and 
And uh, Solomon issues the famous decree, just cut the baby in half and that'll solve it. And, and by saying that, finds out which woman is really the mother of the child. This is the way the Israelites came to their ruler and approached him. And so this remarkable transcript of the conversation in 2 Samuel 14, beginning with verse 4. The woman from Tekoa went to the king. She fell with her face to the ground to pay him honor. And she said, help me, O king. And David answered, said, what is troubling you? And we actually have the transcript of the dialogue between them. I, I'm not sure any other place in the Bible that's written just like this. And so she says, I'm a widow, my husband is dead, pretending this the whole story. I had two sons, and then she tells the story that Joab has put in her mouth. And at the end of the story, verse 8, David feels like it's a very easy thing for him to decide. The king said to the woman, go home, and I will issue an order in your behalf. As far as David is concerned, he's taken care of it. He feels like the, the son should not die, and he issues the order and says, thank you for asking, and now he turns to the next person. But the Bible says, but the woman of Tekoa said to him, my lord the king, let the blame rest on me and on my father's family, and let the king and his throne be without guilt. Just in case somebody is mad at you, King David, for your order, um, let anybody blame me. I'm the one that brought it to you. She wants to prolong the conversation, I think, because David didn't catch the point of the story yet. David is a little dull in these things. Do you remember when Nathan came in, told him this wonderful story, and David said, the man should be killed, and Nathan said, it's you. You are the man. David just doesn't get it. Here's the same thing happening just a couple chapters later from the Nathan story. So the woman prolongs it, let, let the blame be on me. And David replies um, in verse uh, 10, the king replied, if anyone says anything to you, you bring him to me and he will not bother you again. Thank you for asking, now go home and I'll take care of it. And the woman realizes David hasn't gotten it yet. So she said, verse 11, um, just to be sure that it's not just the law of the land, will you invoke the name of God in your decision? Uh, invoke the Lord your God to prevent the avenger of blood from adding to the destruction so that my son will not be destroyed. And David says, as surely as the Lord lives, not one hair of your son's head will fall to the ground. I've done everything you asked now. I'm a busy man, go home and let me talk to the other people. And the woman doesn't let it go. Verse 12, then the woman said, may your servant speak one more word to my Lord the king. David by now is so perturbed by this woman, he's answering her in one word sentences. Speak. That's all he can say back to her. And now the woman says, Look at this, verse 13. The woman says, Why then have you devised a thing like this against the people of God? David's standing there scratching his head. What is this woman talking about? What have I devised? She continues, When the king says this, does he not convict himself? For the king has not brought back his banished son, Oh, that's what this is about. And David begins to understand. Incidentally, it's interesting to me that in verse 13, the Bible uses for the first time the word devised. And I followed that word throughout all of Scripture, and it is an amazing word. And every time that it's used, with one single exception, it's used in a negative connotation. You devise wicked schemes in Proverbs 6. Psalm 35 says, devising false accusations. Psalm 58, devising injustice. When Haman put together an evil plan against the Jews in Esther 8, the Bible says he devised the evil plan. When the chief priests and elders planned against Jesus in Matthew 28, they devised this plan. It is amazing that every time, except one, 
When the word devised is used, it's negative. We'll look at that one in just a second. And then the woman says to David something that shows how her wisdom has come through. He, she says... Like water spilled in the ground, which cannot be recovered, so we all must die. But God does not take away life. Instead, he devises ways so that a banished person may not remain estranged from him. Here's the only word, the only usage of this word in the Bible where it's not negative, and it's applied to God doing it. It's amazing to me the extent to which God will go to make sure that you and I know how much he loves us. He'll do anything necessary, even when it comes to devising plans, to make sure that we know he loves us. And the wisdom of the wise woman of Tekoa is that if this is true about God, listen again, God does not take away life. Instead, he devises ways so that a banished person may not remain estranged from him. Her wisdom is that if this is what God is like, why shouldn't we be that way as well? And if the Bible was written so as to teach us, the lesson for us is if this is what God is like, Shouldn't you and I be like God in this matter as well? God doesn't take away life. He devises plans so that banished people may not stay estranged from him. A woman says, I've come here to talk to you, hoping that you will see that you're hurting all of us by banishing your son Absalom and not bringing him back together. David is standing in front of the woman now, not sitting on his throne, standing in front of her, looking her straight in the eyes. Everybody in the council chamber must have been packed that morning. No one has said a word. Hardly a soul is breathing. They all realize that David has the power to say to the soldiers standing guard, come and take this woman away. I never want to see her again. David steps up a little closer to the woman and he said, now I have a question for you and you must tell me that you will stop your pretending and answer me honestly. The woman said, I will do as you ask. David takes one more step closer. Now he's right in front of the woman's face and he says to the wise woman of Tekoa who's promised to answer him truthfully. Do I happen to hear the voice of Joab in this story? Now nobody's breathing, but everybody turns over to the corner of the room. Where stands Joab? Who's going? <whistles> Me? <laughs> And the woman says, I promise to tell you the truth. It was Joab. And now David says, Joab, come over here. Joab walks in front of David, takes the place of the wise woman of Tekoa. Everybody knows what's going to happen to, to Joab. He has presumed to teach the king of Israel a lesson. And David looks at his old friend, his nephew, and he says, you're right. Go get Absalom in time to come home. And everybody finally breathes in the room. And Joab breathes greater than anybody else. And he turns and quickly goes to obey the command of the king. The story goes on to say that Joab brings Absalom back to Jerusalem. The reconciliation does not happen immediately. Absalom is there in Jerusalem for a couple of years. David wants him in his house, but he doesn't go to see him. 
Finally, Joab and Absalom get together again. Absalom says, I'm ready to see my father if he will see me. And the chapter ends. The chapter ends in a beautiful sight. As Absalom comes into the presence of the king and bows down with his face to the ground before the king in a, in a posture of asking forgiveness. And the last words in chapter 14 say, the king, David, kissed Absalom. Here in the middle of the Old Testament is the gospel story like it is in few other places in the Old Testament. Here is good news for both the banished and those that are estranged. And this morning, if you feel banished from the presence of the King of Kings, take heart in the welcome home. If you have banished other people in your life, family members, church members, members of your family of faith, take the example of the forgiving king. And one more application. Many of us at times feel our own banishment from the presence of God. And we feel that way because God has taken the responsibility, like David did, to banish sinners from his presence. Remember the passage in Genesis 3, verse 23, that it was God who did the banishing in the first place. So the Lord God banished Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which they had been taken. It is God's responsibility to banish sin from his presence. He must do that because he's a holy and just God. But take heart this morning because God has also taken the responsibility to bring back sinners from their banishment. Deuteronomy 30 verse 4 says this, Even if you have been banished to the most distant land under the heavens, from there the Lord your God will gather you and bring you back. God took the responsibility of banishing sinners, but then he also takes the responsibility of bringing the banished back, of devising plans so that banished people might no longer be estranged from him. Our part in this great controversy is to stop our pretending and admit our estrangement, to feel God bringing us back to him, to boldly approach the throne of grace and accept our Lord's forgiveness and relish in his kiss of acceptance. May it be your experience today and this coming Sabbath that's quickly approaching and throughout your life to enjoy the kiss, the kiss of the King. May it be on a, all of our experiences is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me have a word of prayer with you before we leave. Thank you, Father, for this marvelous experience this week of opening your word. Thank you for the fact that you and your character and the gospel message shine out from every page in the Bible. Thank you for teaching us that you will stop at nothing to get us back into your presence. May we accept that. Enjoy your kiss this morning is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for uh, being such a wonderful group to talk to this week, for welcoming me here. I've enjoyed our studies together. Hope to see you again soon.